um, Boris Verbrugge will tell us more about how these SMEs can implement an effective process of human rights due diligence. So you will tell us what are the barriers, what are the risks, but also what are the opportunities they themselves face. The floor is yours. Yeah, we could we could that one. Voila. Okay. Uh, so actually, I will not be talking about what uh, <laughs> what you just said, which is of course entirely my choice, and I changed this uh, over the course of last week. Um, actually, what I will try to do today is to uh, to give you a few insights in how companies in Europe. Uh, so we're no longer talking about small scale producers in uh, somewhere in the DRC. We're talking about companies in Europe, how they uh, perceive this push for due diligence and how they respond or might respond to it. Um, so why do I think I'm able to offer a preliminary response to that question? Uh, because we do a lot of research. Uh, so I work for, for the HIVA Research Institute, Kai Leuven. We do a lot of applied and policy oriented research looking precisely at that question. So how do uh, European companies and particularly SMEs, but not just SMEs, how do they uh, respond to this push for due diligence? How do they put due diligence into practice? Um, and how, I mean, what could this mean for, for actors along their supply chains? Uh, so one of the things I also did last year was organize a few lear learning networks with companies in different Belgian industries including the food industry, retail industry, and the technology industry, which of course has linkages with uh, what we're discussing today. Uh, so what I'm telling you today is, uh, is my own experiences, the lessons I learned from these engagements with uh, different types of companies, and of course also civil society organizations, public buyers, and every, everyone and every actor that engages in this uh, quite difficult and challenging ecosystem. So first of all, um, the push for due diligence, and I won't go into too much detail, it was already discussed by my colleagues, but we're indeed seeing that there's a, a push, a legislative push for uh, holding companies accountable, obliging mainly large companies to carry out due diligence. Uh, so it's a combination of national legislation. So indeed, Germany now has legislation, France has a legislation, Norway has legislation, Belgium and the Netherlands have proposed legislation, which, uh, especially in case of Belgium, will not be adopted before there's a European, uh, European directive, by the way. Um, and then at the European level, it's a combination of, on the one hand, vertical legislation, so issue-based, uh, such as uh, proposed regulation on forced labor, um, as well as sector-specific regulation. Of course, EU conflict minerals regulation is the one that is most relevant here today. Uh, but there's also a regulation which has been um, adopted a couple of months ago uh, to combat the deforestation. And then, of course, the big debate is about where are we headed with this uh, big overarching uh, European directive for corporate sustainability due diligence. Uh, I will not uh, tell you more about the current process. There's other people that could do that. But uh, in the end, I mean, it's very, yeah, it's very unpredictable when we will land with this. Um, it is important, though, to mention that there's already a directive on corporate sustainability reporting, um, and that directive actually tells companies that they have to report on their due diligence. So in that sense, it's already an obligation to some extent. What is also important to mention, it's something that a lot of actors often forget, is that even when we don't have a final directive on due diligence, due diligence is already there. And the market expects companies, actually a lot of companies are already expecting, uh, are ex ex already facing the requirement to carry out due diligence because their clients are asking them to. Uh, and it's not just their clients. So for instance, a lot of the companies I spoke to, they already receive emails from their clients telling them like, you have to be transparent about your supply chain. You have to obtain a certain rating. You have to obtain certain certificates with the eye of eventually becoming more transparent and sustainable. Um, and it's not just the market, it's also the financial sector, because actually what the European Union is trying to do is to use the financial sector as a lever towards uh, a more sustainable economy. And part of it is, of course, this question of sustainable supply chains. So the European Union is trying to regulate uh, sustainable investment and is trying to 
force uh, financial institutions into making certain demands towards their, uh, their clients uh, or to apply due diligence themselves in their investment activities. So long story short, uh, companies are facing a lot of pressures these days to indeed start thinking about how they will engage with uh, risks in their supply chains. And what this does actually for a lot of companies, it's leading to a gradual, but it is happening, a recalibration of, uh, of risk. What do I mean with this? Before companies would typically think about risk as something that might happen to them. Uh, nowadays, that is still the case, but companies are increasingly considering how the risks they create for society. So uh, risks for human rights, risk for the environment, how these risks might come back to haunt them in a way. Uh, so in that sense, it's the idea of, and, and I won't go into detail, double materiality is what the European Union refers to. Uh, the idea that risks you create for others might become risks for you. And this is something that is, that is, definitely, um, that is definitely happening. Sorry. It's a, an inheritance from a flu I got uh, last week. Um, so why Total? Because of course, one of the things that is happening in France right now is that we're seeing a few high profile cases where civil society organizations are uh, suing large companies based on due diligence legislation. That of course, the specter of uh, legal risks for a lot of companies is something that they are increasingly worried about. And that, that is also leading to this, this recalibration of risk and thinking about risk. What is also happening gradually but surely, is that issues that used to be seen as soft and something that the CSR department or the person responsible for sustainable procurement deals with is increasingly dealt with at the level of the board. So we're seeing that questions about human rights, environment, due diligence, risk are increasingly becoming a board matter. And that is definitely something that is different compared to, to the past. This one I think is very relevant for today. If you speak to companies, uh, companies are quite reluctant to engage with what would be termed critical stakeholders. And that of course goes against the idea of due diligence, which is supposed to be about engaging with stakeholders and making sure that indeed you understand the perspectives of those um, whom due diligence should be about. What you see is that companies are well, not necessarily reluctant, but they're wary of engaging with critical stakeholders because, of course, for them, it's also a risk to expose themselves to bad publicity and so forth. Um, so, for instance, when I suggest to companies, why not, uh, why not discuss due diligence as part of your institutionalized social dialogue? In Belgium, we have something uh, at company level, institutionalized social dialogue where trade unions enter into negotiations with their employers, um, that is something they are reluctant to do because they don't want like these very critical voices engaging in the process. Of course, this differs between companies, but as a general observation, I would say that companies are not exactly proactively engaging with these, these very critical stakeholders. So what is happening? What are companies doing? Companies try to cascade responsibility and costs eventually also costs to suppliers. So what they're doing is, for instance, when they require uh, suppliers to carry out audits, what they will do is try to, uh, try to shift the costs of those audits to these companies. What companies will also do is they will uh, use supplier codes, they will use contractual clauses to ensure that their suppliers will have to somehow become more responsible. So they, they basically shift the responsibility to suppliers. And this is also, and that is important to note, it's also something that is actively encouraged by the proposed uh, due diligence directive. So what it says is that companies shall seek contractual assurances from business partners um, that they will comply with the code of conduct, uh, that they will, uh, as necessary, have a prevention action plan, seeking corresponding contractual assurances from their partners. So the idea is that the standards must trickle down from the companies under uh, covered by legislation to uh, suppliers further down the supply chain, contractual cascading, which is understandable. But at the same time, of course, you need to think about what that means for smaller and weaker actors operating along the supply chain. What we also see is that companies uh, continue to rely, or in some cases start to rely on governance, private governance mechanisms that uh, research at least claims to be defunct and um, not very effective in dealing with the challenges at hand. Um, I'm not saying that's the case for all of these schemes there, but there are clear limitations with these, uh, these schemes. 
Um, and I would say that, for instance, right now, the due diligence directive insufficiently recognizes the fact that these, uh, that these governance mechanisms have shortcomings uh, and that they cannot be a sole solution for companies trying to look for uh, some kind of quick fix. Uh, so it's also, again, something that is actively encouraged by the EU uh, directive. And I'm again, I'm not saying that this cannot be part of the solution, but it cannot be the whole story. And there are at least some actors who are now saying that uh, when you're part of a multi-stakeholder initiative, all will be fine. Um, and the question will also be whether or not the regulator indeed accepts that as being fine. And then finally, I think one of the, the key changes we're seeing now is that for a lot of companies, sustainable procurement, due diligence somehow equals sustainable procurement. So what you're seeing now is that there's the proliferation of different supply chain management schemes. So Ecovadis, Prewave, things like that might ring a bell with some of you. Uh, what we're seeing is that these schemes are becoming increasingly popular. So uh, before um, supplier onboarding and supplier assessment in companies was mainly looking at issues like quality, reliability of suppliers. What we're seeing is that sustainability is increasingly becoming a parameter. Uh, for the assessment of suppliers. So what you have is companies pay other companies to provide them with a kind of uh, supplier assessment score, and they receive this scorecard. And based on that, companies will decide whether or not they will continue working with you as a supplier. Um, and in some cases, and hopefully that is a solution in most cases, they will try to work with you towards improved scores. Uh, but, and that's already something I, I will talk about uh, in, in a few minutes, um, where it is commercially viable, viable companies will often opt for the option of disengagement in case you have a really unsustainable supplier. So what does all this mean for, um, for those further down supply chain? And of course, this is still uh, tentative also because a lot of the things we're talking about are tentative and are a future that still uh, lies ahead of us. Um, there are clear prospects for further exclusion for a lot of these uh, small scale um, artisanal miners, for instance. Uh, why? Because we know that uh, the literature on sustainability standards uh, teaches us that uh, often these sustainability standards, while they're, while they're meant to improve the situation on the ground, what they also do simultaneously is to raise uh, the entry barriers. And a lot of these uh, producers might face additional obstacles in having to comply with these stringent environmental and uh, social standards. So that's uh, exclusion by default, one could say. The other option is, of course, exclusion through disengagement. Um, we are seeing that disengagement is happening. We are seeing that where companies have a choice for uh, more sustainable suppliers, they will often drop the unsustainable ones. And that, of course, can be part of the uh, the the policy process and the, the underlying, the underpinning IDs, but then of course that needs to be spelled out. So what you see now is that a lot of companies will simply say, okay, our supplier somewhere is unsustainable, is committing uh, these uh, violations of supplier code, so we will eventually stop working with these suppliers. Important here, of course, is that this is only true where it's commercially viable. Uh, the current geoeconomic and geopolitical context is not uh, such that companies can simply choose who they work with. Um, but still, I think there's plenty of evidence showing that disengagement is uh, happening. One, uh, one case that is quite interesting, I think, and that is now ongoing is the case of Ethiopia. So at one point, Ethiopia presented itself to the world as the new uh, textiles hub. Um, actually, what is happening now is that a lot of companies that initially decided to invest in Ethiopia are now reconsidering or even uh, decided to leave Ethiopia because of the, the situation that is that is right now. Um, I mean, we, we know the human rights situation in Ethiopia. And for a lot of companies, that is, of course, a risk they are not willing to, to take. Uh, so that is what is meant with disengagement. And I think disengagement, it's, it's always been like since the conflict minerals, it's always been the big concern about this type of legislation. Well, I think the concern is still very much there. And I think a lot of the rank and file companies see disengagement as a viable option wherever possible. So then finally, I, I will end with some kind of a tentative um, yeah, solution. I think what needs to really happen right now, companies do not have incentives for real engagement. Companies, why would they stick out their necks and really try to engage with stakeholders that are considered unsustainable and very difficult to engage with? Uh, I think the key lies in creating incentives to indeed, uh, to indeed encourage that kind of engagement. 
Uh, what these incentives must be, I think partially it's a, it's a matter of uh, awareness raising, it's partly a matter of some kind of supportive measures, and that's where the whole discussion about which accompanying measures can the EU take to support companies in sort of uh, engaging in inclusive due diligence. Um, but I also think that creating incentive for mutual, mutual engagement uh, should imply some kind of... Uh, I mean, not, not legal safeguards, but at least reputational safeguards. If a company decides to stick, to stick out its neck and to try and engage with stakeholders in a difficult situation, it should not be branded as a company that is somehow, yeah, um, somehow violating human rights or deliberately operating in a context that is. Uh, so I think companies that indeed engage in this kind of risky behavior uh, should be critically applauded for these efforts, um, and that is currently not the case. I know this can be seen as quite controversial, but it is really an issue right now that companies simply don't dare to take a step towards this kind of engagement. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. I hope it still fits the, the framework of the, of the conference. Um, there's at least one picture with mine.